The Kentucky Small Business Development Center is a statewide, nationally accredited program that provides no-cost, confidential business coaching and training services. Whether you're just getting started or are ready to expand, we have the tools, resources, and expertise to help you succeed. We're part of a national network, America's SBDC, with over 1,000 centers across the nation. To learn more about how the Kentucky SBDC can serve you, please visit KentuckySBDC.com or email us at info at KentuckySBDC.com. You can also reach us by calling 888-414-7232. Thank you for joining today's webinar. The chat feature is available for you to ask questions and interact with today's speaker. Please take a moment to introduce yourself and where you are watching from today. Welcome, everybody, to another session of Wednesday webinar. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Dave Etkin. I am the uh, SBC director here in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we are one of 17 centers across the, the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and so I'm so glad you're joining us today. And as always, just uh, look to your right of screen. You'll see the chat feature. And if you wouldn't mind, just uh, say hello and tell us where you're watching from. It's uh, We really get a kick out of seeing where everybody uh, kind of shows up from. We've had people from all over the world, sometimes uh, as far away as, I don't know, Kuwait or Indonesia. We, I, I don't know how people find out about this, but I'm glad they do. So if you would just say hello and tell me where you're watching from. And thanks for being here today. Um, we are so lucky to have this guest with us today. I don't know if, um, I'm sure most of you maybe are aware of the E-Myth book and, and Michael Gerber uh, and his whole um, methodology um, of the E-Myth, e um, you know, use of um, you know, entrepreneurship. Um, we have Paul uh, Brosher with us. He is a uh, speaker and workshop facilitator with the E-Myth. Um, Paul, he um, owned his own and operated a, uh, his own construction business for 25 years till he sold it. He um, used the E-Myth uh, methodology to, to run his business and, and grow it over all those years. And, you know, real testament is um, being able to sell your business when you want to sell it. A lot of times people will work in this, their businesses all their lives and not have anything to sell. You know, yeah, they may have made a, a great living, but to build something of value and sell it, that's a real testament to the skill and also the E-Myth methodology. So, Paul, I'm really honored to have you here today. Thanks for coming today. And, and uh, I'm just going to hand it over to you. People are really excited to, to hear from you. So, Paul. All right. Thanks a lot, Dave. And thanks, everybody, for being with me today. I feel like I have big shoes to fill after that wonderful introduction from Dave. So good morning or afternoon. As Dave said, I know uh, we're all over the world here, so I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be here. And I do have a lot to share with you. So uh, let's let's dive right in. So at Emith, we talk a lot, if you're familiar with us at all, you know we talk a lot about working on your business and not just in it. And what we found is that while that concept really resonates for a lot of people, it can be difficult to bring to life actually in your business. So what we're going to talk about today is time management. Don't fall asleep when you hear that. We're going to talk about this in maybe a whole different point of view. So we're going to talk about it from a strategic point of view, and we're going to talk about it from a tactical point of view. And most importantly, what I really want for you today is to leave with an understanding of why the differences between those two things matter so much. And then, of course, I'll give you some tactical tools as well for some time management and personal productivity that you can build for yourself to use so that you can consistently work on your business and not just in it. So as Dave said, I'm Paul Bauscher. I am a business coach, so I could work with clients at Emith. I'm also the lead conversion manager uh, at Emith, which means I also work in the sales area. I, I talk with clients who are in, people who are interested in working with Emith. And uh, of course, I also do workshops and speaking events. So when we talk about uh, you read the book, so now what? Of course, the book Dave mentioned that we're talking about is the E-Myth Revisited. And um, the title of the webinar can make it sound like we're assuming you've read the book. I promise you, you don't have to have read it as a prerequisite to be here today. This is hopefully going to be useful for you, even if you've not read it. Um, but I am always curious when I do a session like this of who I'm talking to and what the, how many of you have actually read the E-Myth Revisited book. So Ryan's going to put up a quick poll for us here so we can take a look. If you wouldn't mind just clicking into that poll, 
Let me know if you've read the E-Myth Revisited. Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe I've read a little bit of it. Um, again, not a problem if you haven't read it. We're going we're gonna to walk you through it today uh, just the same. So many of the concepts that I'm going to talk about today come straight out of this e philosophy about how to build a business that works, and which incidentally grew out of Michael's work with small businesses. A lot of people think that the book came first, coaching came second, and it's actually the opposite of that. Uh, I think that's the reason so many people when they read the book, they go, oh my gosh, it's like Michael was a fly on the wall in my office. Because in a way, he really was. He was working with business owners just like you when he wrote it. So looks like we have uh, more no's than yeses, not surprising. Uh, but heck, a good third of you uh, have read the book. So that's great. And then another 13% uh, some. So yeah, about a half and half crowd here today. So that's great. If you've not read it, again, don't worry about it. It's um, it's not um, it's not a problem that you haven't. So now I want you to exercise your fingers in this chat feature and I want to think about that problem of being able to read the book that I talked about and then be able to implement the things that you've found in it. Um, I hear a lot of different things. In my work as a lead conversion manager, I talk with a lot of business owners. I'd love to hear from you what obstacles tend to get in your way of working on your business. And um, lots of the business owners I talk with, they say, gosh, I read it, struck a chord, but I can't find the time, or uh, I don't know where to start. Uh, something like that, finding the time, don't know where to start. What comes up for you? What are the reasons or the, the issues that you bump into when it comes to being able to actually take the things that you learn, either from an e-myth book or some other book, maybe one of these webinars that you've attended, What's the difficulty for you? What are the obstacles that you feel like, gosh, if I could get over this obstacle, I could actually work on my business. So curious if you'd just share with us there in the chat, what, what are some of those things that you bump up against? Is it time? Time's a big one I hear a lot. I wish I had more time to work on it. And then of course, um, knowing where to start, like I said, anything that, anything that you bump into? Uh, one thing that uh, the people bump up into, and me personally, is that um, you wear too many hats. Mm. Yeah. Uh, David says he's unable to delegate work so he can work on the business. Mm. Laura says she has trouble uh, streamlining processes. And Cody says uh, the need to maintain current sales levels in the short term so I can work on my business in the long term. And Denise, hey, Denise, um, she says time. Uh, Jonathan says time with his full-time job. Hmm. Okay, somebody burning the candle at two ends, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Great, great. Well, thanks for sharing those. And those are, like I said, often I've heard similar versions of those same things. So what we're going to do is explore exactly what it takes for you to overcome these obstacles. And again, we're going to talk about it strategically and tactically. And I'm repeating myself on purpose because strategy should always come first so that you can make the time to work on your business. And notice that I said, make the time, not find the time. I sort of joke sometimes with my clients that I've searched all the couch cushions, didn't find any time in them. So somewhere within all of us, we know that the answer is in us. It's in our decisions and what we're choosing to do. Or if you don't know that, I hope you might know by the time we're finished today. So because, as I said, strategy comes first, then tactics. So let's get started in the strategic approach. And the strategy starts with you, the leader. A lot of us want to forget that being a leader means we go first. So because if you want to get different results in your business, you have to do different things. And if you're going to do different things, that's going to require you to think a little differently about your business. So we like to say that the way you think about business is the way you end up doing business. Now, that statement can seem a little self-evident, but at its core, it's really the key to your success is leading your business. Because to grow your business from where it is now to wherever it is you want it to go, you got to do different things, like we said. But you can't do different things just by, just by doing more of the same thing. 10 times more of the same thing. And a lot of times the time management hacks, that's what they're trying to get you to do. 
just give you the space to do more of what you're already doing. And it's the reason that these tactical approaches to time management, they just never work. So let's go a little further into this. If you're one of the people who've read some of the EMIF book, you're already familiar with this, but this idea of three personalities. So you might, it's a really powerful construct because it provides you with a way to talk about and name how you're thinking about your business. And in coaching, we like to say, if you can name it, you can tame it. So if we can name it, we can do something about it. We can become aware of it. So each of these three personalities, each of them represents a different perspective or a different way that you're thinking about your business. We sometimes refer to them as hats because it makes it really convenient to say, gosh, what hat are you wearing when you're solving that problem? Or what hat were you wearing when you came up with that solution? And it's about really making sure that you're wearing the right hat at the right time. Let's dive into them just a little bit. So your entrepreneur, and all of us have all three, remember that. So this entrepreneur lives in you, some piece of you, is focused on the strategic things. Like maybe you're thinking about how to grow the business, how to, how to use the money in your business to leverage it to reach the goals that you have. Maybe you're developing systems for lead generation or sales or partner programs, that sort of thing. But notice how these are all working on the business. That's the entrepreneur's focus. Your technician, on the other hand, is in the business. You're doing things like actually making the sales versus creating the sales system. Maybe you're working in the finances. I talk with a lot of business owners who are actually still keying in their own uh, financial data into say QuickBooks or something else. So hopefully you're starting to see that there's a pretty big difference between tactical technician work, doing the work in the business versus that entrepreneur work where you're actually building a business that does that work. So here's the key thing. When you hear us talk about this, and Emeth, you might start to think that it's bad to be a technician. Uh, there's nothing wrong with either one of these. It's not bad to be a technician. It's not bad to do both of these, these kinds of work in your business. But it is a problem if you're wearing the wrong hat at the wrong time. So for instance, if your technician is the one choosing what goes on your task list or what gets on your calendar, well, you may have a problem because your technician likes to check boxes off, a lot of boxes in a day. I love they, That's what your technician loves to do. So you probably check a lot of boxes off if your technician makes your to-do list, but you don't ever get to actually do the strategic work in your business. You know, that work on the business that uh, that is going to actually move you towards your strategic goals for it. And if you're not working on the business, then the question is who is? Because if you're not leading your business and that's what working on it is, then who is leading your business? And unfortunately, the answer to that is generally no one. So the fundamental difference here really is that your entrepreneur sees your business as the product. That's a concept that's interesting as I work with clients. It takes sometimes months for that to completely sink in and for them to understand what that really truly means completely. But your entrepreneur sees the business as the product and your technician sees your business as a place to go to work. It's a job. Your technician wakes up every single morning committed to creating the product or service that you provide to your customers. And, and you probably do it exquisitely better than anybody else. Your entrepreneur, on the other hand, wakes up and says, how do I create a business that delivers that product or service consistently and predictably every single day? without me, without me having to be the one to do it. So it's a really powerful difference when you think about it like that. And it's related to what we call the fatal assumption. And the fatal assumption says that because you know how to do the work of the business, doesn't mean you know how to build a business that does that work. Because you know how to do the work of the business, you might be a carpenter, you might be a lawyer or a doctor, right? Doesn't mean you know how to build a construction business, a law firm, or a medical practice. So there's, that's two different, very different things. So when you're thinking with these different caps on, this is the difference between you being able to choose to do strategic work or whether you choose to do tactical work. Let's talk about why this matters so much. And I want to take a look at it, maybe three things in your business 
that this will reflect it. You'll see a reflection of this in these three things. I think we can all agree that time, money, and work are pretty three pretty critical factors in your business. So the way your entrepreneur thinks about these is very different than the way your technician does. So your entrepreneur thinks about time and thinks about how do I get the most impact out of the things I do in that time, where your technician is usually trading time for money. How many widgets or what it is, what it is we're doing can I get out the door in a given amount of time? So the way you think about money, your technician, again, typically trading time for money. Your entrepreneur is thinking about how money is a resource to be used to grow a profitable and sustainable business. And the way you think about work, this is key to what we're talking about today in terms of being able to make time to work on your business. When you look at the different work that has to be done, your entrepreneur looks at the work and says, which work creates the business, moves us towards our strategic goals. Your technician says, how do I get the fastest results and check as many boxes as possible? So a key difference in how you go about choosing what you're going to work on. So for those of you who feel like, and I understand the feeling, as Dave said, I ran a business for 25 years. For those of you who feel like I just don't have time to work on the business, what if time actually isn't the reason that you can't work on your business? What if you can't make time to work on your business simply because you're wearing the wrong hat when you're deciding what work to do? So what would it be like for you if you could be aware of this, be conscious about this going on inside you and be in control of which one of those hats that you put on so that you can consciously be sure that you're wearing the right hat at the right time? So here's the problem with that, that most of us run into. Your technician really loves instant gratification. Not to mention you're probably really good at the technician work. Strategic work very often does not give you instant gratification. Most often it involves you working towards a longer term goal. So if you're not aware of this tension that lives between technician and entrepreneur, that tension always lives there in you if you're not aware of it, then it's easy. It's really easy to get hijacked by the tyranny of the urgent. Rather than focusing on the really important long-term goals, you want to, you end up, your technician says, let's focus on this thing that we can get done right now, right now. It's the reason that uh, people get excited about joining a gym, but the longer-term goal doesn't happen right away. So they're gone. They don't stick with it. Question is, which personality do you lead with the most? So let's do a little exercise together here. I know I can't see you. I love doing this in live workshops, but we're going to try it here remotely anyway. Let's do a little exercise. And all you need to do this is something to write on and something to write with, pen, pencil, pad of paper. Heck, you can use a note app on your computer if you like. It doesn't matter. Anything you can write something down with. Access to your task list and your calendar. So whatever form they're in, if you can grab those and have those handy, then before we start, I want you to take a deep breath with me and put on that entrepreneur's hat. You are the person who got up this morning and you see your business as the product. You're making, you're making decisions from that perspective as we work through this little exercise together. So from that perspective, take a minute and think back over, say, the last three to six months. What is one or more important strategic goals that you were wanting to achieve? And if you would have achieved them, they would have made a real impact on your business. So this might be something that's been on your radar for a long time. It might be something that has been nagging at you that you know you should have been doing, but you just haven't made the time to do it. So giving you a little space to think about that. Identify one or more strategic goals that if you would have accomplished them, they would have made a real difference. And once you do that, take a second to think about that goal. Why does it matter? Why is it even important? What's the benefit going to be to you, your business, your employees, your customers? What's the benefit to actually achieving? And then just jot down some bullet points. What's important about it? What's the benefits that you get out of it? And again, just giving you a little space to think about that. If you start to ask why is it important and what does it benefit and you start to figure out it doesn't, <laughs> well, you're welcome. I just saved you a bunch of time. You can stop working on that one. 
Now let's take a look at that task list. Now it doesn't have to be perfect, so don't worry about that. Task list, calendar, whatever you have, you can look back on. I just want you to be able to reflect on the on yesterday, last week, last month, last quarter, whatever you're able to do, whatever you're able to reflect back on and take a look at that and take a note, even if it's just a mental note of all the things that you did over that time period that focused on reaching that strategic goal. Remember, keep your entrepreneur's hat on for this. Don't let your technician convince you that making more sales calls yourself was working on the business because it's not. I hear that a lot. If you were working on creating a sales system within your business, absolutely. That's strategic work. But keep that entrepreneur's hat and be honest with yourself here. Nobody's going to see this but you. Nobody's going to see this but you. But go down that list and see how much of that, what items on that list were actually moving you towards that strategic goal. And we're gonna put up another poll here real quick. And I'm gonna ask you to do some quick, just rough math. No need to get this exact. You probably can't get it exact anyway. But do some quick math. About what percentage of your tasks were focused on achieving your strategic goals? Again, be honest, don't let your technician convince you that doing technician work was strategic. So did you do between less than 10, between 10 and 20, 20 to 40, more than 40, more than 50? What percentage of your time are you finding that you actually spent on strategic work? Got some less than 10s, 20 to 40s, not bad. Interesting. Okay, so we're hovering most most of you are in that 20 to 40 time frame. Yeah, it looks like we're hovering and staying right in that 20 to 40 time frame and then some 10 to 20s. Well, 10 to 20s catching up. Hey, we got a more than 50. That's great. That is outstanding. So more below the 40% line, it looks like than uh, than above it for sure. The real question here is, are you happy with the percentage that you found, right? Or would you like it to be higher? Whoever, uh, the group of you that is in more than 50%, that's outstanding. But even at 50% or 50 or 60%, you might be feeling, depending on where you are in your business, that you need more time even to focus on strategic goals. So how do you think that percentage that you've discovered is actually impacting your ability to move towards those goals and how would changing the percentage impact the results that you're getting. And hopefully you can see that how changing that percentage of focus is going to really change, uh, not just doing more of the same things, but going to change what you're actually focused at working on. Now, here's something interesting. Your technician might right now, as I say these things and you think about them, might be screaming at you in your head going, this guy's nuts, don't listen to him. We have way too much to do. He's suggesting someone else should do it and I'm the one to do it. All this stuff needs to be done and I'm the one to do it. That's just because your technician doesn't like change. And that's that tension I mentioned before about that lives between your technician and your entrepreneur. Now here's the bad news. That tension's not gonna go away overnight. It just won't. Even just recognizing that these hats exist and all three of these live in you, it's not going to make it go away. The good news is, however, that just recognizing it, naming it, as I said before, for what it is, is going to help you overcome it. Because what we want to do is take you from the tension that exists and create a little bit of space there so that as you feel the tension, you know what it is, you can pause long enough to make a good decision that gets you closer to where you want to be. So thanks for uh, your responses there. I appreciate that. So let's go into the third personality type that we haven't really touched on, and that's the manager. Now, lots of people, when they hear manager, they hear the word boss. If that's you, I want to invite you to set that aside for a few minutes with me. A manager, from our perspective, is really someone who gets results through others. You're not getting the result yourself. You're getting results through others. I don't believe, frankly, that good people need a boss. Good people don't need a boss. They need a good manager who can provide them with what they need to be successful at their job. 
They need somebody to provide them with clarity about what their outcomes are. They need somebody to give them a system that helps them achieve those outcomes within the framework of the overall business. And then, of course, they need all the training and support that goes along with it. So we're going to use that task list again. Don't put that away yet. So take that task list and look it over again. And I remember one of our chat responses was uh, trouble delegating some of your work so that you can get it off of your plate. Common, common thing that I hear. But let's look over the task list and find something on it that you think you should have been able to delegate by now. Some, it's, this usually doesn't take people long to find because it's typically a frustrating thing. You've either delegated it out and it keeps bouncing back to you or you are holding on to it like crazy because you're afraid to delegate it to anyone. So identify that thing. And now I'd want you to jot that down so that you've got it written down. Hopefully everybody's found one. That usually doesn't take too long to find it because it's frustration. Now we're gonna ask some questions about that thing. So whatever that thing on your list was, I want you to ask this question about it. What's the biggest reason that you haven't been able to delegate it? What's the biggest reason that you haven't been able to delegate it. There might be more than one. Try to choose the maybe the most difficult or the biggest, the main reason that you haven't been able to get this off your list. If you've delegated it out and it's bounced back, why does it keep bouncing back? If you're afraid to delegate it, why are you so afraid to delegate it? What's that reason that you haven't been able to get it off your list? Now, looking at that reason, not looking at the task that you can't delegate, but looking at the reason you found I want you to just ask, why is that true? What makes that reason true? So if you said, well, there's no one that can do it, why is that true? Maybe it's because you haven't hired someone yet. Maybe it's because no one else on your team knows how to do it yet. And just jot down what you come up with. Jot down what that, why, why that reason is actually true. Now, you're probably getting the hang of this, but we're going to do it one more time. What you figured out is the reason it's true. I want to know why that's true. I go one level deeper. Ask yourself why that thing is true. Why is that even true? So if your answer before was that, well, no one else knows how to do it. Well, why, did the, why does no one else know how to do it? And jot that answer down. We're just digging a little deeper, a little deeper, a little deeper. Now, sometimes you have to dig deeper than just three levels. For time constraints today, we'll stay here. But uh, the next action, I want you to think about the next action you could take to solve that thing you discovered. Not the top line, remember, but the answers you came up with as we went down. Now, if you can't see a next action, you might need to keep digging with similar questions. Sometimes two or three levels down is not enough to find the real core issue. But we want to get down and look at that bottom thing and say, what's the next step I could take to make that thing happen, to fix that problem there? Do you need to create a system so to let other people know how you want it done? Do you need to train one of your colleagues? Do you need to change the way you're doing the thing? Maybe you need to hire somebody different. Maybe it's tougher than that. Maybe you have to let someone go that you've known needed to go for a long time. Sometimes that's the reason something keeps bouncing back. And we're going to chat in again. Get your chat ready. What I'd love to hear from you is what you discovered going down this process. You can share with us what you discovered at the bottom, like what was the reason you found, or maybe just what was your experience like as you did this digging into this issue. What kinds of things did you discover about your issue? And remember, you, what you share is going to be potentially jogging ideas free for someone else. And you may get some feedback by reading what someone else shares might help you as you think about uh, my, as you think about how to solve your issue. So that's what I love about this forum is that all of you sharing in the chat here gives us all something to learn from one another. The power of the group coming together like that. So what did you find? as you got down to the bottom. Or like I said, you can just share what your experience was like going through that. Because every time you have a frustration or something you're bumping into, you're almost always looking at a symptom and not an actual problem. And to find the problem, you have to do what we just did. You have to really get insanely curious 
about what's underneath it. And that's how you're going to find different solutions and solutions that lead to lasting change, not, not band-aids or firefighting solutions. So, yeah. So Paul, um, David says he has, as he says, it's hard for him to find qualified help. Uh, Laura <clears throat> says uh, she doesn't trust the process that the process is transferable, uh, has trouble creating a training, you know, to, to move things in that direction. Uh, Cody says, um, I'm delegating tasks to my VA, my virtual assistant, but my technician brain keeps asking, are these the best tasks she could be doing? Mm. I feel increasing the amount of time I spend on strategy can best ensure this answer is yes. Mm -hmm. well, I love that from Cody. That's uh, what my encouragement to you, Cody, was let your let your entrepreneur brain answer that question rather than your technician brain. Right? Mm -hmm. Peggy says hers is financial. Okay. Good. That's good. Well, thank you for thank you for sharing those. That's uh, the experience of going through that. This is a very light experience of it. Um, but it's really, as I said, it's about the only way you're going to get to the core issue of why something doesn't get off of your task list. So, and it's and it's really the only way that you're ever going to be able to approach delegating effectively uh, is getting a system in place that you can trust the system. I think one of the responses was, "I don't trust the process uh, that it'll actually get done correctly." And unfortunately, what happens a lot of times is the person gets blamed. And if we get honest enough and dig enough to, to acknowledge that it's a missing or broken process, or maybe we just don't trust the process, then we can focus on the real solution. So you might hear all this and go, well, that's great, Paul, but uh, now what? <laughs> now what do I do? Hopefully digging in didn't make you feel overwhelmed. Sometimes people tell me that that's the way it feels. But um, what I really was hoping you would do in that experience is see a connection. Uh, see the connection between what you're doing day to day and your strategic goals. With strategic work that's going to move your business in the direction of your vision, it has to be addressed down here in what you're doing day to day. So I promised you we'd talk about some tactical solutions as well, and we're going to do just that. Your people need you, as we were just discussing, they need you to provide systems and clarity. Well, you're no different. You need systems as well to give you clarity and support you as well as you try to do the hard work of focusing on the important work. So let's talk a little bit now about how to set up your own time management system that's going to support you in actually doing that. What we're going to share with you at the end of this session is our time management handbook. And inside that handbook, we have something called the time management toolkit. The toolkit has seven elements to it. I'm just going to touch on a few here today with you. The first one, of course, being become a master prioritizer. And this is everything we've been talking about so far today, shifting the way you think. Now, if you're like me, you've read 100 or more, probably, I've probably read more, uh, blogs about time management. And they all kind of say the same thing, which is make a list, prioritize the list. But none of them tell you how to prioritize the list. And that's because they can't. They can't tell you. Only you can make that choice. Only your entrepreneur can make the choice that's going to have you focusing on the right things. So the second one, keeping a calendar that works. That says keep a calendar. I'm saying keep a calendar that works. Keep a calendar that works is important because, again, you have to let your entrepreneur decide what gets on that calendar. You want to put important things on that calendar and then protect it from getting cluttered up with busy work technician work, work that you can build a business to handle so that you're not handling it. So in that regard, when we think about your calendar, what I'd want you to put on your calendar very first of all will be what we call the EMIF hour. This is an hour a day to work on your business. And a word of warning here, your technician hates this hour. I have clients all the time who tell me when I sit down for that hour, my technician is screaming at me saying, you need to go do some real work. So stay aware of this because it's what makes it really easy to skip out on that EMIF hour. I can pretty much promise you that the tension I mentioned before is going to show up in a big way when you try to actually sit down and spend an hour, even just an hour out of your day, working on your business. So Ryan's going to put up another poll here. I'm just curious what the reaction is going to be from all of you, what you think about spending an hour a day on your business. 
when I mention this to clients or to, to people in workshops, I get a varied response. I'm curious for you, how hard does that seem? Uh, do you think you could definitely do it? Maybe you could do it a couple of days a week. Well, I could try. Uh, I have some honest people who just say, Paul, no way. There's no way I can do it. So I'm curious where you are. What does an hour a day feel like? My hope is always that it doesn't feel overwhelming, that it makes you feel like I can take this small step each day uh, working on the business and get some traction and actually getting where we want to go. So it looks like we have a lot of definitely. That's good. Maybe a couple days a week I could try. Trying is good. Trying is good. And I, and I love that somebody's honest enough to say, I'm not sure that I could because it's a difficult thing to do. I had one client who really struggled with it. And I said, would you, he wanted to hire a CEO for his business. And I said, if you had a CEO in your business five years from now, and he did the work that you're doing, or he or she did the work that you've been doing, and you were paying them a CEO salary, how would you feel about that? Uh, he said, I wouldn't be happy at all about that. <laughs> so it's, it's, however, I've got to help you look at it to get you to do it. Uh, I'll do it. Okay, so most most of you are in the definitely col column. We have about a quarter of you in the maybe a couple days a week, a quarter in the try. Good, no, no ways. That's that's a good thing. So maybe think about this as you look at your calendar after this session today. Can you go in and just physically block out that hour a day, uh, that emeth hour, whatever you want to call it is fine, uh, but that emeth hour to actually close the door, turn off your phone, shut down your email and actually focus on working on your business. I know some of you just got nervous when I said shut down your email probably. So the third item on our time management list, and the last one I'm really gonna dig into today uh, is time tracking. And I gave you a, just a small taste of what it was like to look at your time a few minutes ago. This is a deeper dive uh, because you can't change what you can't see. It's so important to understand what's going on for you right now. What are you actually spending time on right now? In system development, we would call this a baseline. So what's the, the baseline of what's happening currently so that as we make changes, well, first we might know what to change, but as we make changes, how are those changes affecting what's going on? So it's so important that this is not what you feel like you're spending time on. It's what you are actually spending time on. And trust me, there's almost always a difference. I don't wanna be a downer here, but let's be honest, not many people wanna do this. I know because I've done it and I know because I asked clients to do it. And I don't think any of them ever reached through Zoom and high-fived me and cheered me for asking them to do it because it can feel a little like drudgery. On the other hand, every person I've worked with who really commits to doing it was able to use what we found in the work to make some useful discoveries about what they were doing and why they were doing it. So here's how you do it. You're going to track your time for two weeks. I usually recommend a clipboard or something, a pad of paper. Or There's a million apps out there now for an iPhone or an Android that you can track your time. And you want to do it really in the moment. Because if you record things in big chunks of time, it's going to be hard for you to learn a lot from it. You want to really do it in the moment and get specific with it. Then you're going to look down that list, sort of like what we did a little bit ago, and categorize that time, E, M, or T. By now you all know that's entrepreneur, manager, or technician. Then you're gonna analyze your activity and see what percentage of time you're really spending working on strategic work versus doing the technician work. This is gonna give you a much truer picture than the rough estimate we made earlier. Then you can identify uh, what you're really spending your time on. Identify whether your strategic time is more or less than your technical time. And then the important part, what we sort of dug into together a few minutes ago, is explore what you find and analyze the activities that you find on your list and find out why do I still have them? Can I get rid of them? When I do this with clients, we go through things on the list and we really dig in to what can and can't be delegated, why they can't be delegated, why they should be delegated, or maybe why they should even be eliminated. So just like we did it, it's just a deep dive to uncover what's in there. And it always uncovers important things about their relationship to time, their relationship to their people, their systems, their work, the work they're doing. Uh, you know, sometimes we discover what I call the Superman effect. When you're really good at what you do, you get a lot of pride out of that. You get a lot of satisfaction 
out of that. It can be hard to delegate that to someone else and give away all that personal satisfaction that you get. Uh, I just had somebody yesterday tell me, Paul, it feels good when someone calls me and I'm the guy that has the answer. But what he doesn't realize is he's become what I call the toll booth. <laughs> all the traffic has to go through him. And that's why he was in an exhausted state, of course. So the next step is to start taking intentional control of what you focus on and understanding the perspectives, those two different perspectives. This requires you to set aside a few minutes every day to plan and weekly. I love the idea of a daily plan and a weekly plan. So the weekly plan informs your daily plans, uh, but it requires two different perspectives. You've got the planning version of you and the doing version of you. So that manager and entrepreneur in one corner and the technician in the other. So you got to be sure to have that entrepreneur manager hat on when you're doing your daily and weekly planning. You have to create space for this, that idea of blocking out time on your calendar. Maybe your emeth hour on Fridays or Mondays is to do your weekly plan. That You can use it that way if you like at first. It gives you space to step back and sort of away from the fray and say, what's important and what am I going to focus on? Because if you don't have a plan, then it's next to, to impossible for you to ever say no to something that comes along, which means anybody with an email account, and let's be honest, that's almost everybody you know or everybody on the planet at this point, anybody can lob anything into your inbox and hijack your time. But if you have a plan that you've already decided what's important, you can look at what comes your way and make a good decision about what's actually more important to do, not what's actually yelling at you. That's that space to think that I was talking about before that I want for you so that you can have the space to actually make a good decision you can actually work on it, not just in it. So this is the only way, frankly, that you're gonna create the space because tactics without this thinking aren't gonna fix this for you. It's the only way you can overcome the tension between your technician and your entrepreneur and build a business that isn't so dependent on you. So the tactical part of what we've outlined here, most of this probably is not new to you. You may have, there's so much stuff online, you may have read about some of these things. Time tracking is not brand new. That like every other system in your business, it's not going to work if it lacks your strategic discernment that you gain by thinking about your business in this way, by getting that entrepreneur's hat on. That's the only way this tool or any other tool is really going to help you. Now, the rest of the handbook, which you can download, Ryan's going to put uh, up for you to be able to download here toward the end of the session. Uh, I'm not going to dig into these today, but getting a distraction blocker, so important in today's world. Some way to keep distractions from jumping in, especially into your emeth hour. Build brainstorming into your planning process. Again, your emeth hour can be your brainstorming process. Creativity goes away when you've got your head down doing technical work. You, be, you come up with real creative ideas and decisions and solutions for your business when you've got space to actually think. Managing your projects more effectively. In the handbook, you're going to find some suggestions for some different apps and softwares, uh, ones that we use even at EMIF to manage our projects better. Uh, this is giving you the ability to make sure that you're a manager of those projects and less actually being the technician building them. And all of this is going to work together to develop your strategic perspective. I could argue that strategic perspective is actually what drives everything else on this list. I probably would argue that, actually. All right, so get your questions ready because I'm going to jump into those next. I want to acknowledge what all of us already know. Change is hard. As I said before, if change wasn't hard, the gyms wouldn't only be busy in January and we'd all eat a healthy diet every day. And building a business that works isn't easy work either. You already know that. But you don't have to do it alone. Emith pioneered business coaching 44 years ago. We continue to innovate it every single day. And an Emeth coach gives you somebody in your corner who's not just cheering you on. We do that. High fives are warranted. But also somebody holding you accountable to your strategic goals so that you have that you have and make the time for that Emeth hour. They're going to hold you accountable to things like being in your Emeth hour. And they're equipped with, of course, an incredible array of design guides, system design guides in our case. They're going to help you get all of your great ideas, all the solutions you want about how you want your business to work. Get those out of your head. Get those out of your heart. 
Somebody commented earlier, I don't trust the process. This is the process. We think of business as substance and structure. Substance is your people and your leadership. Structure is the systems that, that support all of you in doing great work. And it's in those systems and structure and substance that you can actually build something that comes to life. It's how you build a business that works instead of you being the one who has to do it all. As I mentioned, Ryan's going to put the time management handbook uh, in Webinar Jam here for you to be able to download. So I invite you to do that. If you want to know more about a coach, feel free to use the link that Ryan's going to also drop in the chat. Um, you can sign up for what we call a free coaching session. I do these myself as well as my uh, lead conversion team. So you won't necessarily get me if you jump in and sign up for one. But it's an opportunity for you to have an experience, much more robust experience than what I gave you today and digging into what's really the underlying issues or underlying things going on in your business. You'll get that experience of what what and how an EMYTH coach does that when they work with you. I promise you this is not a sales pitch. That is not our style. It's not a sales pitch at all. I always explain it as a test drive. Before you buy a car, you test drive it. If you wanna see what it's like to work with a coach, jump into a free coaching session and take, take the opportunity to spend an hour with one and see what it's like. Uh, Ryan's gonna drop that link into the chat. And Dave, I think we're ready then to take some questions in the chat as well. If there's any All right. Questions. Paul, that was spectacular. I've made a ton of notes. Thank you. <laughs> you know, what's, uh, what's interesting, and I hadn't really thought about it, but um, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, I, um, I had an EMIT coach for quite a while. And, um, you know, you're going through this today. I noticed that, and I hadn't thought about it in quite some time, but the place to start is is with yourself not with the business though right absolutely absolutely it's um you know it goes back to that thing of the way you think about business is the way you end up doing business and there's another there's another uh, principle that i use a lot that is a business is a reflection of its owner or its leader and it can be both rewarding and difficult to look at our businesses and say, how is what's going on in my business a reflection of my leadership and management? Uh, that, can be, that can be difficult, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a necessary thing to be able to start to really uncover what's going on. Yeah. So uh, now is your opportunity to pick Paul's brain. If you have any specific questions, put them in the chat and we'll get right to them. Um, the, the other thing, I, and I've, I'll be honest, I've said this myself because, you know, I've, I've, been aware of the time tracking process, but I often say, I don't have the time to track my time. I mean, what, <laughs> how, do you, how do you get over that? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it really defines the real issue, and that is just the idea of making time. Uh, like I said before, I, I sort of joke with clients sometimes that I checked all the couch cushions, didn't find any time. The truth is we all have to accept eventually that we make the choice about how to spend our time, how to invest our time. And um, it's it, it that's why I like to acknowledge how much of a hassle time tracking it. It could be my own personal <laughs> re resistance to it. Uh, I try to do it about once a year, honestly, just to sort of gut check what I'm spending time on. Um, but the answer to your question is uh, make it as easy as possible. Get an app for your phone, carry a pad and pen, whatever works for you. Just make it as easy as possible. It's never perfect, Dave. No one ever gets it perfect. Uh, you just want to really make it as real time and just honestly jot it down. I love when I see one from a client that says, I spent seven minutes on a phone call. I spent mm -hmm. 38 minutes in a meeting. I spent, cause they're being truly honest and truly tracking it. <clears throat> and what I found is that two good weeks does the trick. If you can just gut it out for two good weeks, uh, you'll, you'll collect enough data that you can start to really learn something from it. Yeah. So Cody wants to know, um, how would you modify the EMIT recommendations for self-employed professionals uh, like me, who, while we can delegate things, we can't fully walk away because we are the product? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, it is a great question. And it's, it's what kind of separates the idea of a practice from a business. Uh, mm -hmm. So it sounds like Cody's goal is not to actually build a business that replaces him. So sure, some of the some of the principles do um, have to be applied differently. It does become a little bit more about making Cody 
efficient uh, and and making he has to really make really good decisions about how to use his time because there's whatever he doesn't do isn't getting done. Mm -hmm. So it requires even more of that uh, ability to prioritize. But yeah, it is a divergent point between if you're a solopreneur uh, versus someone who has a staff or employees, um, you're definitely going to have to approach that differently. There's no doubt. Not not being an e-myth expert or anything, but I do uh, recall a lot about the discussion on systems. I mean, you know, the more you can put systems into your solo practice so that you are actually delegating to a system as opposed to somebody else. That's right. And it's it can be easy for solopreneurs to say, I don't need systems because I do everything. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing how much efficiency gets gained in an activity when you take the time to stop and systematize it. Even if you're the one using it, you get more efficient. Uh, and I've been through a um, process with somebody where we actually got down to the point where we were analyzing their morning routine because we were trying to figure out where his days got off track. We actually analyzed his morning routines. And I mean, down to when do you brush your teeth? Then what do you do? Then what do you do? Then what do you do? Right. So and it was funny because we shortened his morning routine from like three hours to an hour and a half just by taking the time to think it through. So even when you're the one doing it, an analysis of what's going on is beneficial. Yeah. So uh, again, it's uh, if you have some questions, put them in the chat there. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about the um, what, what you were calling like the emyth hour at the end of the day. You know, your strategic hour. Um, and I think it's easy to kind of carve out that hour, but I think it's a bit more difficult to really get some value out of it. And, and you know, mentioned. Can you talk a little bit about how to how to structure that and, um, you know, uh, how, what would you tell a client that, got, that has the hour? What That's would you tell fair. them? To do? Yeah, it's a good question. So clients are a little easier, Dave, simply because we have the EMIF program that we're working through. Uh, so we're giving them clarity of what to work on in that hour. But that is a common complaint that if I build out the hour, I get there, I sit there, turn off my phone, turn off my computer. I don't know what to do with the hour. Uh, it's a common complaint. My... Um, <laughs> The way I usually handle that is to, when you're doing your weekly schedule and you put those five hours in, think about what you're going to do ahead of time in each one of those hours. Say on Monday's hour, I'm going to do X. On Tuesday's hour, I'm going to do this. On Wednesday's hour, I'm going to do this. And I break it down this way sometimes for clients, even working through our program. You know, I might say in, in Monday's hour, read through this material and then and, and find this data in your business, right? And then Tuesday, do this. And we, we might plan it out together uh, because that is a common issue. You're not used to having it. You're not used mm -hmm. to having a space to work on the business. So it's really common to get there and go, what the heck do I do with it once I have it? Yeah. But I, I would planning is everything. Um, it's it's about knowing what you're going to do before you sit down. Otherwise, then it's super simple to get distracted by an email or something else. <laughs> yeah. And you, and you mentioned about always kind of baking in brainstorming. And what are your brainstorming tips for this? Hmm, well, brainstorming can be a lot of different things. So it can be, you know, you could have a, a issue or frustration that you're dealing with in your business. Maybe you set aside your hour and just take that thing to, to brainstorm solutions to that. You could be doing that on your own. You could be doing that with others. It's important to remember that if you have a staff and you have especially a leadership or management team, you're working a lot of time. Doesn't have to be alone. You don't have to be the lone ranger here. You can you can involve your staff in actually solving these problems. But really, I like to think about the brainstorming time. It's just time to think, just time to actually think about it. I have a, a good friend who owns a business here locally, and I help him out with his business as well. And um, he's found that he has to go on a walk. He has to literally get out of his office and just go on a walk. And that's how he creates his thinking time because it gives him some space between all the stuff going on in his office. Hmm. Lisa says uh, she now knows she needs a system. So I know there's a system to create systems. Maybe you can share a little bit about uh, some best practices for that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, basically our whole program is a system for creating systems. It's, it takes a, a individual pieces of the business. We break them down. Uh, we have what we call system design guides. So it helps you walk through the process a little bit like what we did today, where you're digging in and finding the root causes of it. Um, I, I love a process we use called key frustrations. It walks you through an eight step process of of uncovering what your contribution to the problem is and so forth. So 
Uh, when you need a system, my I guess the biggest advice I would give is make sure you're identifying the true problem first and what the outcome needs to be. I very often find that people create an ineffective or wrong system because they haven't spent the upfront time to actually identify what the problem is and what the real outcome is that they want. From there, we can start to figure out the steps of that system that have to actually take place to get that result. But if you're unsure of what the outcome is or you're unsure of what problem you're really solving, you're probably not gonna create a very effective system. So, you know, when you work through the system, do you, are, are you, do you have to document it? I mean, what, what about the, what about the hard outcome? How, how does that, how do you put that together? Sure. In today's world, it takes a lot of different forms. There's still sometimes we have clients who put them down on paper, um, but documented, yes. Uh, our rule at EMIT, if it's, if it's not written down, it's not a system. You probably remember that one, Dave. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it's in your head, it's not a system, it's a habit, is what I always tell clients. If it's in your head, it's a habit, it's not a system. Uh, so you want to get it down. There's literally a litany of ways to do this. I mean, we go from people who write them in a Word document to a Google Doc and share them out with their team. There are softwares out there that are designed specifically for housing these that also double as an opportunity to be able to uh, use them for training those systems. So mm -hmm. it really depends on your business, how your people are going to access them and get to them. Um, you know, the physical, I always let the business tell us what the physical representation of those needs to be, but they definitely have to be documented in some way. Uh, otherwise, you're still the holder of knowledge and that's what you don't want to be. Right. Well, you threw this out, so maybe you should just say just a little bit about the key frustration process. <laughs> well, key frustrations really just focuses on, like I said a minute ago, uh, helping you drill to find out what the real frustration is. Because like what we did a little bit earlier, a lot of times the frustration you think is the issue is it's a symptom of the frustration. Mm -hmm. And so that process really helps you dig down and find out what is the real frustration and then we start asking you what the real contributing factors to that are. What, how are you as the owner contributing? Because we're all about personal ownership. You know, how are your people contributing? How is, how is money, materials, supplies, timing, all these different things, how are they all contributing to it? Then we've truly uncovered the problem. And most people are shocked, frankly, at how easy problems become to solve once you've really uncovered what the real problem is. Nice. Lisa says, thank you for that. Uh, she, she liked that. Um, so um, looks like that's all the questions we have. We're right at the top of the hour. So, Paul, I can't thank you enough. This has been this has been really great. Good. Thank you, Dave. And um, I really encourage everyone to, um, you know, to reach out to Paul and take advantage of that and download the um, download the guide. And um, as always, we'll send you guys the recording this later on this afternoon and, and the slides and everything. So. Um, please take advantage of all these resources. Um, the e -Myth is a great resource. And, and Paul, I want to thank you for sharing everything you, you did today. It's been, been really enlightening for me. You're welcome, Dave. I appreciate you having me. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. We'll see you again next Wednesday. Paul, thanks once again. You're welcome. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining today's webinar. At the Kentucky SBDC, we know small businesses are the heart of our economy. That's why our goal is to help business owners start, grow, and succeed in Kentucky. Find out more about how our no-cost business coaching, training, and resources can help your business. Visit us at KentuckySBDC.com.